Hello, and welcome to Fun Friday here on Answer Everywhere. Today we're taking a look at the source code for the, the game Quake, which was a groundbreaking first-person shooter that lots of people know and love. Uh, now, I don't think I've ever necessarily played Quake. I'm vaguely familiar with it, so I'm probably not... Um, you know, a lot of people watching this will... Whoa, now. What is going on? Um, no, I haven't really, I don't, I'm not sure I've ever really played Quake. Um, I'm vaguely familiar with it. So a lot of people watching this video will know a whole lot more about me. And if anyone's in the, in the chat who's super familiar with Quake, uh, let me know and uh, I'll try to, you, you might be able to help direct me to, to, to things that might be especially cool. Um, I am, uh. Let me grab this chat. I'm um, I I vaguely recall that there is some interesting stuff in how they did uh, the 3D rendering. Although I might be thinking of Doom, the game that preceded it. Um, I believe Quake had real 3D. Uh, so in the README, it says something about OpenGL. Um, and maybe we can pull up the Wikipedia article. Let's see. So the 1996 video game. And uh, inspired by the works of H.P. Lovecraft and Gothic fiction. It had a rusty capitalized font. The capitalized font, I'm sure, is what many people remember about Quake. Um, and I think, let's see, I think I saw something here about OpenGL as well. At early, so, okay, so unlike the Doom engine before it, the Quake engine offered full real-time 3D rendering and had early support for 3D acceleration through OpenGL. And they had, I guess, multiplayer death matches like, uh, like Doom. And maybe the most important thing I've learned about Quake recently is that um, Linus Torvalds reportedly uh, spent a lot of time playing Quake to... Uh, as, to according to this account that I saw, to stress test the Linux, the early Linux memory at the time. So Linus, if you're, if you're listening, if you if you ever see this, let me know if you want to play some Quake and look at the Linux kernel code together. <laughs> That'd be a lot of fun. Um, so I'm going to grab this. Um, I'm going to grab this chat over here. So Karin's saying, hi, hi, uh, I got, um, as is common for me, I got a little bit of a late start compared to to what I said. So sorry, I was, I was a bit late. Um, and have I heard of fast inverse square root algorithm in Quake? It's a work of art. I have not, but let's take a look at that. And so I have Quake, the, the GitHub open, and I also have it open in source graph. And we looked at source graph, the, um, the repository, the code yesterday, but um, we also used the tool source graph um, and so I'll try, I'm going to try looking at the, the Quake code again through that, through that particular tool. Um, let me see if there's anything here on GitHub before I go. Linus, thank <laughs> you, Chad. Hi. Hi, Tat. How goes it? So um, John Carmack, uh, obviously from id Software, is a, is a well-known guy, um, well-respected as being very clever. Um, in his in his game designs, as well as the games being, you know, giant hits and resonating resonating with fans and all that, all that sort of good stuff. Um, so yeah, let's look at the inverse, the inverse square root algorithm. I'm not sure. Let's see what we can find. Um, so in the README, which I just closed the, the GitHub version of, and I'm gonna. Uh, Take source graph and make it dark. Um, so Visual C++ and the Windows compiler, I think, is what MASM is. Or no, maybe that's some sort of assembly. Maybe Microsoft assembly. Let's look up MASM. Macro assembler. An x86 assembler. All right, so some... Um, that was Microsoft, right? Yeah, Microsoft. So Microsoft assembly thing, uh, OpenGL versions, et cetera. And the, uh, the code is all licensed under the terms of the GPL. 
but I think the assets are not. Here we go. All the Quake data files remain copyrighted and licensed under the original terms, so you cannot redistribute data from the original game. So you can't like download this code, I guess, and run a version of Quake. Uh, or maybe you can if you have the assets. But um, but if you don't have a license to the assets, th then then you can't and you can't like redistribute Quake with the assets and whatnot. All right, so let's take a take a peek. First of all, let me resize this chat to be smaller. And let's rescale this. Okay. And how do I get out of the readme? Maybe just back. Okay. So we have three directories, WinQuake, QW, QC, and QW. Now, what does it say about these things? For WinQuake, GL Quake, which I guess is probably OpenGL, and Quake World. Is Quake World like a follow-up game? Quake World update. So maybe it's some update to Quake. And software such as Quake Spy, making the process of finding and playing against others on the internet easier and more reliable. So it's a multiplayer option, I guess. Um, I think let's focus on maybe the, the heart of Quake as much as we can, which, so QW, I'm going to guess is Quake World. WinQuake should be Quake for Windows. QWQC. Maybe Quake World, you see? Huh, what is QC? Let's take a look. How about weapons.qc? Weapon and weapon hit functions. This looks like C. I'll ask this person. Who's this? Cody? But Cody remembers my session from yesterday. So what does um, the QC file extension mean? Okay, it's Quake C. It's the scripting language used by the Quake engine to implement the gameplay logic. The QC files contain Quake C code that defines entities, weapons, items, and other gameplay elements in Quake. It looks like C. Is this just pre-processed C? See if Wikipedia has an entry on Quake C. Game world. Oh, thank you, Karin. Quake C, okay. It's a compiled language developed in 1996 by John Carmack of id Software to program parts of the video game Quake. The program is able to customize Quake to great extents by adding weapons, changing game logic and physics, and programming complex scenarios. It can be used to control many aspects of the game itself, such as parts of the AI, triggers, and changes to the level. What I want to know that is, though, what kind of language is it? Quake C source code is compiled using a tool called QCC, presumably a play on GCC, into a bytecode kept in a file called progs.dat. <laughs> okay, the program is of Quake modifications could then publish their progs.dat bytecode without revealing their source code. Presumably you can disassemble it though. Most Quake mods are published this way. Okay. So I guess that was intentional to allow people to, to, to update the game. The syntax of Quake C is based on C, yeah, explaining its name, but it does not support the implementation of new types, structures, arrays, or any kind of referencing other than the entity type which is always a reference. Quake C also suffers from the fact that many built-in functions, functions in the functions prototyped in the Quake C code, but actually defined within the game engine and written in C, return strings in a temporary string buffer, which can only hold one string at a given time. In other words, a, a construct such as some function ftos num1 ftos num2 will fail because the second call to ftos, which converts a floating point value to a string, overwrites the string returned by the first call before some function can do something with it. Hmm, okay. 
QuakeC does not contain any string handling functions or file handling functions, which were simply not needed by the original game. Okay. So this was, I guess, before game people had really discovered Lua. Most games at the time had their logic written in C, C++, and compiled into the executable, which is faster. So for a while, everything was written in assembly. Then I guess they eventually decided performance was good enough that you could write in C. And uh, I wonder if we can find QCC, the compiler. The page does not exist. And um, Ennis, I guess, is asking, do you do any preparation for the session on the code? I do some preparation, um, but not. I don't usually look at the, the source code before I start. So I did, I've done a little bit of background research for, um, for various things. Uh, like I, uh, like I, I did a little bit of, of just background stuff on, on Quake cause I wasn't so familiar with it. Um, but not a lot. Okay. Um, so here's, I have references to QCC. I'm wondering if we could find QCC itself. I'm not sure what the syntax here would be. Maybe file UCC star. Maybe QCC other thought. It's possible that QCC is just not part of this release. Yeah. All right. Let's try just straight grab for fun. We have QC files, we have progdefs.h, and just everything else is either QC or H or C. Progs might, um, that might just be reading the files. I'm not sure. And this is all Quake World stuff. Okay, cool. Actually, just let's, since we're here, let's start with um, progs.h. Why not? This should be the file that like reads uh, progs.dat or does something with progs.dat. Okay, so we've got PR comp, which are defs shared with QCC, and prog defs, which is generated by C defs. And we've got this union of eval s. I guess this is going to evaluate stuff. And we have strings, floats, a function type, and ints, and an edict. I'm not sure what an edict is. Um, and then we have this edict s thing which has a Boolean, a Q Boolean called free, uh, a link type called area, number of leaves and, uh, some leaf nums, an entity state T, which is baseline and, um, free time and whatever V is which is, it says V is C exported fields from progs. So for, oh, free time says the um, SV time when the object was freed. Okay. And then we have this, let's see, some externally designed, defined stuff, maybe from GC, from QCC. Progs, functions, global defs, field defs. And then uh, I'm guessing maybe PR is prog. So we can init prog, we can execute a program, which takes in a function type. We can load progs, profile, maybe performance profiling. Um, ED, do we know what ED is? Edict? Maybe something. We can allocate and free ED stuff. We can make a new string, I guess. Returns a copy of the string, allocated. In the server string heap. And simply print, write, and parse edict. You can write globals and load from file. Okay. 
more edict stuff. We've got some G types like G float, G int, G edictum. I guess global. Because G float says it's PR PR globals thing. Um, and then we have PR built ins. What is PR program? Prog? I think it's prog, right? And then we've got some trace stuff, argc and uh, run error, etc. Cool. What are the chances prog C is in here too? Oops. We have prog defs, PR exec.c, PR edict.c. How about PR compile? Is that what this is? This is shared. And I don't know what OFS is. But I guess null return parameter zero to seven and reserved. And we've got some enum with things like done, multiply, divide. So I guess this is maybe the bytecode. Address, return, go to, state, etc. And then we have a struct for a statement, which is a sh which has a short, and the short is just the opcode, it looks like. And then shorts ABC, which might be arguments. Or is, um, something, something argument like. And then we have this struct, um, a ddef, which just has a type in an o OFS. I don't think I know what o OFS is, but this seems to be the, the code that's going to be, that's going to be like, um, part of the, part of the compiler or, or working with bytecode and that sort of thing. Okay, cool. So that's, that's some of the QCC stuff, just so, so we have a flavor as we look at some of the QCC files. And I think with that, let's look at the, some of the QCC files. Because that's going to, I think, define, um, define the world in a, in a meaningful way to, the, to people who have played the game. Now, where were those? Oh, they were in another directory, I think. How do I go up a directory? Back. I guess I'll just do this. Okay, QWQC. Okay, this is Quake World QC. Maybe I want um, all of the. I want all the files that are QC files from the window directory. Let's see if I let's see if I can do that. So lots of Quake World and Quake World QC, but not any um, any WinQuake stuff. So I'm wondering if I don't know if that means anything. Does it mean that this stuff came after WinQuake um, and that they didn't have QC? I'm not sure, but let's look at some QC stuff. So let's look at weapons. I think I opened before, and I have no syntax highlighting because this is not a well-known language. I wonder if source graph has Quake C syntax highlighting. No. Okay. So I'm just going to en enable C mode. That's good. Okay. So what are, what sorts of things do we have? We've got, um, this T damage. I'm not, it seems to be some sort of uh, void function with a damage type. I don't know if it's like returning a damage type, but um, it takes, it seems like it takes a bunch of arguments and they're all entities except for float. So the entities are target, I guess, infliction, inflictor, attacker, and damage. So attacker can be different from inflictor. And player run is a void function. I guess maybe that's running as in um, kind of walking quickly. Um, T radius damage. So this is some damage radius. And it's going to take an entity, of, which is a bomb, maybe like a grenade or something. But, uh, and then why is my keyboard not working? 
Ja, jag ser. So we've got a bomb, an attacker, a radius, uh, entity ignore. I don't know what ignore means. Maybe that thing is not um, affected by the bomb, but you can only do one of them. I don't know, in some D type, maybe damage type. And this is dam damage radius and spawn blood. It's going to take a vector or probably origin and, and uh, a damage. And then there's some super damage sound, which I guess you can play if somebody receives super damage. We use this pre-cache thing. We're going to pre-cache a bunch of sounds, I guess, uh, like maybe read them from disk and, um, and have them ready to play. They don't have to be read from disk, um, when they get, when they get triggered. Cool. Then we have some random function, C random, which is going to just call random, subtract half and multiply by two. I'm not sure really why I don't remember what random returns. And then we have things like fire axe. Weapon fire axe, maybe. So if I just look for weapons, I think I see things like fire axe, fire shotgun, fire shotgun, fire shoot gun, super shotgun, fire rocket. I guess these are um, firing in the sense of like a Fire axe means like use axe as opposed to like an axe that's on fire. I'm not sure. Zero to one. Okay, so random returns zero to one. So we're subtracting off a half, which will which then return negative a half to half, and then we're multiplying by two. So I guess we we want um, an interval between one and negative one. Is that is that the idea? An open interval around zero. All right. Um, okay. So what else? So we have attack. We have change weapon and weapons frame. Let's just look at one of these for for fun. Uh, I guess let's do fire axe. So we have vectors for source and org. What is org? Maybe origin. Maybe vector to translate back to the origin. And then we're gonna make vectors with self dot v angle. I don't know where we got self, but I guess. Um, this is being called on some entity or whatever. And then the source is going to be the self.origin plus 0016. Maybe 16 has something to do with the size of the act. But self-origin is different from org. We'll figure out maybe what org is doing. Then we're going to trace a line from the source. The source is v forward times 64. And passing in false and self. And if the trace faction is is one, we're going to return. Otherwise, we're going to set org to the trace end position minus v forward times four. I don't know where this v forward stuff is 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 doing. We have sixty four here and four here. These are kind of like magic numbers. They don't have any um. They don't have any obvious meaning to me. They're both powers of two in this case. I don't know if that matters. I'm not really even sure what V4 it is. And I don't know where um, trace end position came from. I'm guessing it might be just populated by what's called a trace line. And then if the trace entity takes damage. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, oh, I see. Maybe this is, maybe trace line is, is, is basically doing something like I have some axe. Um, let's look at what a quake axe looks like. You have the quake wiki. All right, this is kind of too dark for me to see. What if I undarken it? It's not much better. Okay, something like this. 
and I guess it has some length, right? And it's going to, as you use it, uh, it's got some sphere of influence. And I guess trace line is trying to figure out what's within your, your sphere or radius of influence. Where's he next? Oh. Um, and then, so that's what I'm going to guess. And if trace function is, is trace fraction is one. Okay. So maybe, maybe trace line, um, sends out a, a vector, shoots out a vector, like a, a ray of light and stops when it hits something. And maybe one means, um, we were able to trace out a full length and didn't hit anything. Maybe we, we did 1%, a hundred percent of the, of the tracing. Um, and then v forward times 64 would mean that somehow 64 is the the max of of what we might hit, I, I guess. Um, so otherwise, so if we're done here, then trace fraction is is smaller than one, presumably, unless trace fraction is poorly named. Um, or no, I mean, I guess it could be anything. I'm guess, I'm thinking of it as a trace percentage. I don't know if that's true. And um, we are going to do, so So if trace fraction is not one, then we're going to take the trace end position. So whatever the, the trace stopped, and we're going to subtract off a of forward vector four. And so if, if assuming forward means forward, then we're backtracking for whatever's, maybe four pixels, four, four units of something. And then... Uh, if trace ent take damage, I guess if somehow trace ent might know, uh, what the, what the object it hit is, and we're checking if it, if it takes, is, it, is the sort of thing that takes damage, then we're going to set, um, axe hit me to one on trace entity, and then we're going to spawn, spawn blood using 20. I guess this is probably some. Um, so 20 is, it, it, it's probably a number that, that differs from every, uh, for every weapon. Um, and we're going to spawn it from org, I guess. So whatever, so org is the origin of the blood. So wherever we hit, maybe with, the, with the trace endpoint, the, the blood's going to come like four away from that. Maybe because it's otherwise would be interior to the, to the, uh, to the, the entity, the graphic thing. Um, and if deathmatch is bigger than three, uh, we'll do more damage. We'll do 75 damage. Otherwise, we're going to do 20 damage. So if, if we're done here, then trace and take damage is false. And so I guess the inference is that we hit a wall. And then so we play a sound with... Uh, whatever Chan weapon is, I guess maybe a weapon audio channel. And we're going to play the axe hit two wave attention normal. Maybe I think it, I'm, I don't know. Add in is normal. Uh, maybe that's something to do with like volume. And I'm going to write some bytes, right? Okay. So message multicast service temp entity message multicast TE gunshot message multicast three. And we're going to also write the, um, org X, org Y, org Z. So that, I guess the X, Y, Z components of the org vector. And then we're going to call multicast. We're, we're going to cast out the org vector, I guess, using the message that we, that we just populated, presumably. Now I'm not sure why, uh, so I, I'm guessing that since we're in Quake world, this might be part of a 3D player, and, and that's why it's being multicast. But what I don't understand is why we're um, multicasting org if we hit a wall, and why we're sending gunshot. I'm not sure, but maybe we'll learn more as we go. And Karin's saying, I think they're just using magic numbers everywhere. No constants. I think that's right. 
Um, so let's look at, uh, so wall, wall velocity. I don't know why walls have velocity, but maybe this is the velocity at which something hits a wall. Spawn meat spray. <laughs> so, if we, so spawn meat spray is going to take an org and a vel. What did Axe take? Like nothing, right? Yeah, so Axe took nothing. So um, spawn meat spray is going to take an, oh, no, no, spawn blood. Let's look at meat spray. Okay, so uh, it seems org, I'm going to guess, is origin. Uh, vel is velocity. Um, so we're going to create a, mi a, a missile and a new vector org. Does this shadow this org? I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know the syntax, so maybe this is, who knows? Um, and we're going to spawn something. We're going to call spawn and, and assign it to missile. Okay, but I guess spawn doesn't know anything yet. But we're going to set ourselves to be the owner. Um, it's going to move by bouncing, I guess. And it's not solid. And then we're going to make vectors on some angles that we ha that we keep in ourselves. Maybe this is the, the blood spreading angles. And then we have some missile velocity. That's just the velocity we passed in. And then in a Z direction, we're going to add 250 and then 50 times random. So this is, I guess, uh, making it spurt a lot in the Z direction, which might be Y for some video games. I mean, it might be um, horizontal for some video games. Because like, otherwise, the blood would be spurting up. And then the, the random is just giving it um, like a more realistic character, I would guess. And then whatever a velocity is, maybe acceleration velocity. And then we're going to set the missile duration. And then zomgib MDL is going to be the model. Zomgib, maybe zombie gib something. And then we're going to set the size of the missile to zero and set the origin to the org. And I guess the missile is zero i don't know i don't know what this is doing maybe zero zero is like the origin it renders to everyone maybe yeah yeah it renders i think that's right i think that's what um i think send multicasting is is sending this so that everyone renders it but i'm not sure um it seems like we're only doing multicast if we hit a wall why are we not doing multicast if something took damage, maybe that's because T damage multicasts inside that function or something. Could be going up. <laughs> that's possible. I'm not familiar with, I'm not as familiar with, so familiar with Quake. So I don't know, I don't really know what a lot of the animations look like. Okay, so that that's window. That That's, I mean, that's, that's weapons. That gives us a couple of, um, a sort of feeling about how things work. Should we look at sprites? or server, or items, doors, combat, files. Let's see, what do we think plats is? Platform functions, OK. I think I want to look at server. So server should be the server, right? I have to tell it to use C mode. Okay, and just poking around, we have things like move target. Do we have like HTTP? IP? Socket? Network? No. Okay. So, but we do have some stuff. So we have monster ogre. We've got different kinds of monsters. Ogres, demons, shamblers, knights, army, wizard, dog, zombie, boss, hell knight, fish, uh, shalrath, enforcer, all done in an event lightning. Oops. Okay. So the movement target code, the angle of the movement target affects the standing and bowing direction, but has no effect on movement, which always heads to the next target. Target name must be present. The name of this move target. Uh, target is the next spot to move to. If not present, stop here for good. Pause time is the number of seconds to spend standing or bowing for path stand or path bow. 
don't know why these argu these monsters are bowing. The move target is just going to move to the target. Um, I guess let's let's take a quick look at the implementation. So if um, if other move target is not the self, what's other? I'm not sure. Maybe this is checking if something else is is already there. And if other enemy returns, a move target, something is bumped into a move target. If it is a monster moving toward it, change the next destination and continue. Is bumped into a move target. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Um, the target is the next spot you're going to, and move target is not move to target. Maybe we're moving the target. And when we change the target, we, um, we, have to do some recomputation or whatever. If our class name is Monster Ogre, then we're going to play some ogre sound, play chainsaw drag sound, I guess, if we call move target. Here's move target F. Is this all there is in server.qc? We're going to move target. Hmm. Cool. Spectate sprites. Maybe let's look at maybe let's look at triggers. Multi wait wait time has passed. Multi trigger, the trigger was just touched, killed, used. Self enemy should be set to the activator, so it can be held through delay. So wait for the delay time before firing. Okay, multi killed, multi use, multi touch. Faked trigger multiple no touch. Must be targeted at one or more ent entities. Okay. Trigger a monster jump. Walking monsters that touch this will jump in the direction of the trigger's angle. So I guess these are things that can trigger actions that are like in-game. Let's take a quick look at Sprite. And then I think we'll head to the C code. I missed I miss Tar Baby. I intentionally missed Tar Baby. Um, I don't think that's a... Um, I think that's... Uh, 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 <laughs> I think that name is is a bit is a bit problematic. I don't even, I'm already in C mode. Um, so sprites is just this weird stuff. So we're in QC. We've got this diner, dollar sign thing. So dollar sign sprite name as explode dollar sign type VP parallel. And then the frame stuff frame 24, 20, 56, 56. I don't know what this is really doing 120 24 216 88 56 all right and we've got a sprite name s bubble who knows i certainly don't these are only these are the only sprites still in the game i don't know what's going on with this file i'll ask cody Was it sprites.qc? Okay, so Cody doesn't have access to the code. That's okay, Cody. Um, all right. So maybe we'll go back to source graph. I still don't really see how to um, jump up a jump back a directory easily. What does this brain icon do? It certainly doesn't jump back a directory. Maybe here on the left, if I get rid of quick start. Repository root, okay. Um, so let's look at WinQuake. We have data, which might be mostly empty. Okay, we have things like readme, manual. We have a manual, the basics of gameplay. Goal of the game, skills, episodes. Cool. And docs. DXXDK is probably, I think, is that the Windows graphics thing? Gas to Masm is some, sounds like a utility that translates into Masm stuff. Kit, who knows? SciTech might be interesting. Solaris, we can make it on Solaris. Here's in SciKit. SciTech, rather. Lib. 
uh, this looks like Visual Studio stuff, perhaps. Here's Kit. 3DFX owners, read the 3DFX text file. On a standard OpenGL system, all you should need to do is run glquake. To run glquake is to put uh, glquake.exe in your make directory. Okay, so this is some support for, for graphics for different hardware. And then it seems like most of the files are just in the um, in the main directory. And so what do we want? Quake hypnotic spec. We definitely want that. Um, Quake icon. There's a lot here. And you know what? I find this. I'd like to see more of the files, I guess. D. What is the D stuff? D local, D init, D I face, D edge. Let's look at D edge. Let's look at D draw. D init. D seems like it might be low level. Poly S A, poly S C, scan and scan A. Vars, maybe surf, sprite, sprite eight, sky. Z point. I don't think we open draw and draw C. A bunch of GL stuff, including meshes. I'm going to maybe ignore those. I'm not sure that's wise. We have the GL quake and the GL quake two headers. Host and host command are probably useful. Math and mathlib. This may, that might have the inverse square root function. Um, menu, I guess we're going to ignore a model might be good. MPLib. I don't know. Some net stuff, net BSD, BW, IPX, DOS, net sir, might be server, UDP, windows. Uh, I'll look at a couple of the net things, but not a lot. Um, and then we have prog defs, which I think we explored around that a little bit. Q.bat. I don't know what Q is. I guess maybe Quake. That's probably not so important. Quake def. Quake assembly. I guess let's look at assembly. Let's look at Quake def. And a bunch of R stuff. Yeah. Uh, hi, Martin. Yeah, this is the repo for the game Quake. We've got a bunch of R stuff that seems also graphics-y. Like clip, maybe something to do with clipping. Uh, drawing, alias, maybe alias, draw, edge. Refrag or efrag. Light, local, main, and miss. I mean, it's, I think the, dra the graphics are supposed to be cool. So anything that looks like it might be cool, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna open. And then we'll, we'll probably be pretty aggressive about, about closing stuff out if it doesn't look as cool as I thought it would be. And then a bunch of sound stuff, which I'm going to mostly ignore. We have sys.h, sv main. I don't know what sv is, but we'll look up sv. Sys, I'm going to guess, is mainly stuff for like platform-specific stuff. vid.h, this might be like platform-specific video stuff. Oops. Um, and so I don't think I want that. Wad. I guess we'll get wad. And then winquake.h. Whatever rc is and world.h. And zone might be an important concept. Did I miss anything at the top? Did I get common? Console. Chase seems good. I don't know what CL is. CD audio and a bunch of CD stuff. Block 8, block 16, some assembly stuff. A norms, maybe normals. And some windquake stuff on top. Cool. SVbiz.h. Okay.
we have fizz.c. Am I missing a fizz.h? We're going to include quick def. Okay, I don't see a I don't see a fizz header, but um, but yeah, let's look at the C file. And actually, since we're here, let's do this first, I guess. All right, so push move objects do not obey gravity. Looks like all the C files, all the C files, were stored in one file, not grouped by definition usage actions. All the C files were stored in one uh, one folder. Yeah, that's right. That's a that's a not uncommon pattern that we've seen with a lot of um, older code bases. It seems like sometimes they eventually acquire libraries. I don't know if, uh, or, or folders, but that might be like later editions. It seems like a lot of people used to just put all their C stuff in one folder. Okay, so I feel like my, my window on the code is, is not as large as it could be. Like I think in, um, can I make it any larger? I'm not sure. Let's also, I'm going to try the original CSS to see if I like this better. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So here's Quake Def. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, what are we doing? Here's his uh, SV Fizz. Let's see, we're importing Quake Def. And we've got this note about push objects. They don't obey gravity and don't interact with each other or trigger fields, but block normal movement and push normal objects when they move. Okay, so push move objects are like are like stumbling blocks. Um, on ground is a, is a set for toss objects when they come to a complete rest. It, on ground is set, is set for toss objects when they come to a complete rest. It is set for stepping or walking objects. And then Doris, plats, et cetera, or a solid BSP. I guess plat was platform in the sense of, I think you can stand on. I saw plat earlier and I, and I assumed it was platform in the sense of like um, computer operating system platform, but I guess it's like floor. So objects, plats, et so doors and platforms are solid and they are push objects. So they push against you, but they don't like come at you. Bonus items are solid trigger. So when you get an item, it triggers some stuff. And move type toss, you can toss them, I guess, like grenades. Corpses are solid knot and move type toss. Okay. Crates are solid B box, maybe bounding box. I don't know what BSP means. So we have solid BSP and solid bounding box, I guess, and move type toss. Walking monsters are solid slide box and move type step. And flying and floating monsters are solid slide box and move type fly. I guess the, in this case, the box is sliding. All right. And here we have friction. So we have friction, gravity, velocity. And these are Uh, they're what? They're like they're kind of like an array, a CVAR type. Kind of like a mixed array, right? We've got string, string, bull, bull, string, string, and then we have string, string, bull, bull. So maybe it's either two strings or two strings and two bulls, that type. I don't know. We've got the origin, which is set to zero, zero, zero in the coordinate system. Move epsilon is 0 0.01. So I guess that's the, uh, the, the like quantity of movement. You know what, I'm going to open this file in Emacs. Okay, so we have move epsilon. 
All right, so, so check all ends. This is presumably going to check all entities by walking some data structure, but let's see what it does. See if any solid entities are inside the final position. So we're going to set check to the output of edicts. And then um, next edict on sv.edicts. So is ed is this a list of, of entities? Edict, I guess, is entity dictionary. And maybe we have a list of them. At any rate, we're gonna set check to the to the next of whatever this um, this structure is. And then uh, we're gonna iterate from e equals one to while e is less than the number of edicts in SV. And on each iteration, we're going to increment E and get the next edict. So it seems like we're walking a, a linked list or, or, or something with, that's ordered where we can call next. Um, and we're going to, if it's free, we're just going to continue. There's nothing to do, I guess, if it's freed. Uh, and we're going to look at the move types. And if they are any of push, none, follow, or no clip, we're going to do nothing. Otherwise, we're going to call SV test entity position with con printf, maybe console printf, entity and invalid position. So this is just checking that um, if any solid entities are inside the final position of what? I don't know, but we're checking whether, I guess some position that we're maybe moving to Perhaps, but now I want to know where's, where's SV defined. We have SV in it and SV main. Let's look at this. Let's look at, uh, SV in it and SV main first, I guess. Did we get a comment, the server main program. So SV is server. That's good to know. And what do we have for the initializing the server? We've got like physics content constants, like max velocity, uh, gravity, no step, friction, edge friction, that sort of thing. Um, and then we're going to register the variables and iterate over some stuff, iterate over the models. Um, we're uh, we're going to S printf the local models at I. Hmm. Okay. Where does local models get populated? Okay. So let's see what happens after in it. We have this comment that says event messages. SV start particle, make sure that the event gets sent to all the clients. So start a particle, I guess it's going to send a particle to all of the networking, all the clients on the network. And it's going to have the origin, the direction, the color, and the count. I don't know how it knows what kind of particle it is, though. It doesn't seem to have like a type. Um, and we're going to so create I and V. If datagram size is bigger than um, max datagram, we'll just return. Otherwise, we're going to call this message these message write functions and write coordinate functions, which we've seen some of before. Then we're going to iterate over um, the directions. There are three directions. It seems like this is some, some, some vector function. We're multiplying things by 16, checking if they're bigger than 127, in which case we're clipping them at 127. And similarly, if they're smaller than negative 128, and then we're going to write, uh, write that down. This is like a cleaning up in case we're trying to pass in something too big, perhaps. And then we're going to write the color and the count. And then we can start sound, I guess, for the sound system. Each entity can have eight independent sound sources. Each entity can have eight independent sound sources, like voice, weapon, feet, etc. Channel zero is auto allocated, and others override anything already running on that entity channel pair. An attenuation, okay, that's what atten is, not attention. Attenuation of zero will play full volume. Larger attenuations will drop off volume. 
So this is kind of like inverse volume, essentially. OK, client spawning. Send server info sends the first message from the server to a connected client. This will be sent on the initial connection and upon each server load. So the servers, I guess, will tell each other about things. Um, connect client initializes a client T for a new net connection. This will only be called once for a player each game. All right. And then we have um, we have check for new clients, uh, frame updates, clear datagram, which is just calling SV clear on the datagram. Um, add to flat PVS. The PVS, I don't know what PVS is, must include a small area around the client to allow head bobbing or other small motion on the client side. Otherwise, a bob might cause an entity that would be visible to not show up, especially when the bob crosses a waterline. All right. We've got to have some, some area around the client. Uh, I don't PV, uh, no. Does anyone know what a PVS might be? Fat PVS calculates a PVS that is inclusive of all leaps within eight pixels of the given point. Is there a PVS? Let's see if this is a general thing. Potentially visible set. Here we go. In 3D computer graphics, potentially visible sets are used to accelerate the rendering of 3D environments. They are a form of occlusion calling whereby a candidate set of potentially visible polygons are pre-computed, then indexed at runtime in order to quickly obtain an estimate of visible geometry. So we're gonna, we, we're gonna keep some set of potentially visible items that's gonna tell us um, whether something needs to be drawn or even like reasoned about, like do, do any sort of sorts of computations about. So that's what PVS is, a potentially visible set. So fat PVS is one, is a potentially visible set that's inclusive of all leaves within eight pixels of the given point. Eight pixels sounds small, but I guess that might be large. We can write entities to client, which will take a uh, client, which is misspelled, Mr. Carmack, and um, a message of si a message buffer. And we're gonna find the client's PVS like doing some vector addition and we're going to send over all entities except there's another typo here, man. Just kidding. Except the client that touched the PVS. So we're going to say, um, and is equal to next edict. So we're going to iterate over edicts, I guess, again, and somehow send them. We've got this no draw, uh, EF no draw stuff. Um, mode line index. Okay. And we've got this big, a bunch of itch, if statements here. And then we're going to actually write a message here by calling this message write byte stuff. Okay. So what I wanted to know originally was like, what are entities? As, uh, what is it? Next edict. Let's look at what edict is. In server.h. So edict type, what is edict type? Edict type is in progs. And edict type is, oh, it's a thing that we looked at. It's got a bool, I guess, whether it's free, been freed, a link type for the area. And then leaves. I, I'm not sure what leaves are. Maybe, but, but it's an int. Number of leaf and then leaf nums. Then an entity state, which is the baseline, and free time and end bars. Well, I don't, I don't know what a leaf is. Leaf makes me feel like it should be a tree of some sort, but we don't have more edicts in this tree, but maybe we're keeping track of information about the, um,
maybe we're keeping track of a related something or other. And what is link type? Link type is in common. Link, oh, okay, so link type has a previous and a next. So that's the link structure. But why is it called area? And what is it a type of? So link type. I typed up the struct. And it's going to uh, have this link s thing. I'm not sure why it's called area. Maybe find usages of area. Oh, this is just finding all occurrences of area. Maybe in world. Unlink edict. Maybe area is just called area because it's like the other entities kind of near the the entity. Returns a chain of entities that have origins within a spherical area. This is just some radius function. I don't think this is about edict area. Hmm. I'm not sure. Let's go back to source graph. Um, and so we've got this edict thing. So next edict will presumably just get the next edict. Query windquake. It's going to call. Okay, next edict just takes the edict type. Um, and it's going to just do like pointer addition, pointer arithmetic to get the next one. So um, it's not so much, so it's really like a vector. We're really thinking of it as a, as a, as a vector and indexing into the vector, I guess. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. And is that how... I still don't know what area is, but maybe we'll um, we'll figure it out. So SV run think, hey, runs thinking code of time. There is some play in the exact time the think function will be called because it's called before any movement is done in a frame. I don't know what thinking is. It, is it like the characters are thinking? We've got this think time, and I guess entities know about what is entity v. And we're going to get the next think from V. Let's see if we can go to the V definition. Nothing. Let's try Emacs again. I wonder physics, right? Yeah, here we go. What do I want? V dot think next, next think. So I just want to know what thinking time is. So it's in prog defs dot h. Maybe this one. Next think. Player pre-think, player pre-think. So maybe the player just pauses and thinks for a while. Hmm. All right, then we, in physics, we have impact, clip velocity, including some overbalance thing. Slide off the impacting object, returns the blocked flags. We've got back off, change, I guess whether things are blocked. And we're going to have this dot product. That's cool. And some stuff. Uh, let's see what else 
is in the in the physics. Just let's get a sense for it. So, so apply movement, add gravity. We can push entity, push move, uh, push rotate. Um, run, think, fly, move, we've seen a bunch of these. Physics pusher, check water, wall friction, walk, move. And there's a physics client, which might be related to the networking stuff. Physics none, physics follow, physics follow, toss, step, step. And then and just a, some sort of physics object. Let's look at this physic, physics object thing. Or is it function? Um, let the programs know that a new frame has been started. We've got some PR global struct. We program global struct for self, other, and time. I guess it's a first person shooter, right? So self is just the the per the the object for whom the we are the first person view of. So self and other are both set to edict to prog of sv.edicts. So they're the same thing? Or is there, I don't know. Is there some way that the, the first one is consumed by self, and then the remaining is just the tail? Um, then we're going to iterate over each object and treat it in turn, as it says in this, in this comment. So we're going to iterate, check if it's freed, um, if it's not freed, we're going to look in the global struct force retouch. And uh, if that's true, we're going to call it linked link edict on entity with true force retouch, even for stationary. I don't know what that means, but something about <laughs> retouching it. Maybe retouch means it needs to be redrawn. Is that like marking it as, as dirty? Let's get link in edict. Touch triggers. The second argument is touch triggers. Okay, so maybe um, maybe for triggers that need to be retouched multiple times to trigger. I don't know. We'll check clients and set the physics client. Check the move type and do some other kind of checking and setting by calling out the SV physics. So we're just basically, um, this is essentially like a form of dispatch. We're figuring out which function to call. And if we're forced to retouch, then we're going to increment forced retouch, or sorry, decrement forced retouch, which I guess is consistent with my theory that this is for objects that has to have to be touched multiple times before you trigger something like a, I don't know, like a, a, pl a plate that's perilously close to the edge. If you bump it twice, it might fall, but if you bump it once, it might not or a bomb that, that you have to touch multiple times. And then we're going to just set SV time to host frame time. I guess increment the, um, probably indicate that some, that some physics time has passed. <laughs> Let's go quick. Hey, I'm a check. All right. So, th so, so that's a, that's physics. Um, I would like to, there was something I wanted to see. I want to know more about um, what it what it's really doing with the entities. I think no, I, I wanted to look at e edict uh, to prog, I guess. But I want to look at the windquake version. So edict to prog is just going to, I guess, cast e as a byte array and subtract off the the the, the pointer from. Um, SV edicts. Hmm. So it seems kind of like it's re just, just kind of like rescaling. Is that what it's doing? Have, so edict to prog, we're going to pass in some pointer or some maybe entity. And we're going to do some pointer subtraction with whatever is, I, I don't know. I'm not sure the right way to think about it. But this is progs. So I guess maybe it's 
um, translating stuff from the the um, Quake C scripting world to the real C world. Okay, so this is physics. What else do we have? Quake Hypnotic Spec. What is Quake Hypnotic? Is this a game? Is this the design doc for the game? Packager is Dave Kirsch. The Scourge of Armagon is the highly claimed mission pack for id Software's Quake. Scourge offers three new episodes. Here's a breakdown of exactly what will go and get inside Scourge of Armagon. Some, it seems like an advertisement. Let's see if we can find the Quake design doc. Is there one? Actually using emails, not GitHub is something wrong. No, nothing's wrong. I'm just, I'm just experimenting. Um, I've been using a Emacs, uh, for with like, with like tags and LSP stuff, for maybe like two, three, four episodes, maybe. And then I've also been using, um, source graph since yesterday, we looked at the source graph code yesterday and uh, I'm thinking of it as, as kind of a, um, an open source version of the code search tool I was used to at Google. So I'm just kind of exploring uh, source graph as a, as a possible way to have more, more of the features that I'm used to um, compared to GitHub. Quake designer. Here's an early Quake design document I picked up when visiting id software. You, did this person steal this? Um, training area will teach beginner players. Uh, okay. This doesn't look like a, a real full design doc. We walked around a bit on the way out. I saw that a sheet of paper and I asked if I could have it. I scanned it and sort of forgot about it. All right. I don't know if there is a, I don't know if we can find, um, design docs for, for things like Quake and Doom. Sometimes for old games, you can, you can find them. All right, here's um, D-Edge. I'm not sure what D-Edge is. Probably something about an edge. We've got MIP level and scale for MIP and screen width and some graphic-y stuff. We can draw a polygon. We're in, this, we're in the C file, right? right? Draw a polygon is a void function that takes no arguments. So, so it takes no ar arguments, it, it does nothing, and it has no implementation. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where if its implementation gets defined somehow, somehow else. I'm not sure. Um, stuff about MIP. We can draw a solid surface. Fix me. Clean this up. I don't think this, <laughs> I don't think this file is ever going to get fixed. I hate to tell you. All right. So um, surf T. We've got the surf type. Oh, I guess surf must be surface. Yeah. And color. So we're going to draw a solid surface with a color. And how do we, how does the surface, surface must be some collection of triangles, right? So whatever E span type is, we're going to span a P destination um, and U, U2, and PIX. And PIX is going to be, we're going to shift over color by a bunch of different things and or them together. Pix must be something, I guess, short for pixels. Color is an int. And we're oring it together and turning it into an int. I'm not sure why you do this, this transformation. I'm guessing, um, So eight, 16 and 24. 
prioritizes picks as an int. I'm wondering if it's um, if color means whether to color that pixel we'll see we'll see I, it doesn't it, I, I don't see how you could you could have like a color as a hex value right so presumably presumably that would somehow need to be turned into something like an rgb thing um and maybe that's some of what's going on here because we have we're in base two right and so we're kind of spreading out whatever is in color into um, different parts of the integer. Although 24, yeah, um, I'm not sure. We'll have to think about that as, as we're reading what's going on. So we're gonna set span to be surf spans. So surf, the surface has some concept of, of spans and it's got multiple of them. We're gonna iterate over them. And P destination is gonna, we're gonna take the view buffer and adjust it by the screen width. What are we doing? We're drawing a solid surface. Okay. And um, whatever U is, we're setting U and U2. And then uh, we're setting PDEST at U to be picks. And then we're checking if the, I guess, U2 and U are, are, are uh, integers, right? If their difference is less than eight, then I guess they fit in, um, there was it zero, two, four, eight, the first four slots of an int, I guess, is that what we're doing? And um, if we fit in the four slot, first four slots of an int, then we're gonna increment u. Uh, while it's less than u2, we're gonna uh, iterate over it and set pdest at u to picks. Okay. Otherwise, we're gonna do some other stuff. We're gonna end it with three. Three should be, what? So one, one is populated um, and two is populated. So that's what, one, one, zero? We're getting the first no no one 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 right something there should be two ones um and we're setting you to that and then we're decrementing by four and then doing some more stuff do we end it again now, so once we've ended it with three, we're going to decrement and then iterate uh, or, or, uh, while it's less than U2, but we're not doing any more ending. I'm not really sure in terms of like computer graphics, what's entirely going on. Um, so... But it does seem it does seem like what we're really caring about is the the positions of ones in an integer, like using the using the integer as a um, like a set of flags. And I'm guessing that, but mm, I don't know. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna ask ChatGPT. Thirty-two bit color value using the provided color value. Shifting the color value twenty-four bits to the left into the most significant bit, then oring the result with the three more copies of the original color value. Shifted by the left. Yeah. Okay. By zero bits respectively. Oh. Okay. Yeah. That's a good point. So th these are multiple copies of the same color. I don't know why you need that. Next, the function loop through each span of the surface, drawing the solid surface for each span. A span is a horizontal section of the surface that lies within a row of single pixels. A span is a horizontal section of the surface. 
Okay, so we're drawing like line by line. Like we're imagining doing like old fashioned line scanning, like a CRT monitor, I guess. And for each span, the function sets the destination pointer, pdest, to the starting pixel in the row corresponding to the patents to the span's v coordinates in the view buffer. For each span, the function sets the destination pointer to the starting pixel in the row, yeah, corresponding to the span's v coordinate in the view buffer. Okay, and then it sets the value of u to the starting pixel in the span and u2 to the ending pixel in the span. The function then sets the pixel at the u coordinate of the pdest to the 32 bit color value. If the span's length is less than eight pixels, the function loops through each pixel in the span and sets its value to the 32 bit color value. If the span's length is eight or greater, the function aligns the u coordinate to a multiple of four and then sets the color value for each group of four pixels at a, at a time. Next, it sets the remaining individual pixels after the last four pixel group. Okay, that actually makes a fair amount of sense. Um, all right, cool. So what is it doing? It's void. So what's actually doing the drawing? PDEST? The PDEST is, is this buffer. So I'm guessing this is the buffer that, that, that's maybe ultimately drawn. Let's look at view buffer. The pixel T. All global and static refresh variables are co collected in a contiguous block to avoid cache conflicts. That's a good idea. Fix me, make into one big structure like CLRCV. <laughs> Fix me, do separately for refresh engine and driver. Okay, so we have this view buffer. Um, let's see where, where else view buffer is used. Can I find, what's it called, find references? So scan is doing stuff with view buffer. Vid win C is uh, setting vid buffer to con buffer. Vid and con buffer to whatever and vid direct, I guess. Oh, setting everything in all. Never mind. Um, I'm guessing view buffer is ultimately what, what's going to be drawn. Let's see if you can see anything about graphics. I don't know. Okay, so whatever, so uh, somehow the things it's setting in here are, are, are going to be rendered onto the screen. Um, and it seems like, according to ChatGBT, it's essentially doing it line by line, um, which would make sense. We can calculate gradients. I'm not sure, I'm not positive what MIPS is. MIP, not MIPS, just MIP. Let's look at MIP graphics. MIP map. In computer graphics, MIP maps, also MIP maps, are pyramids that are pre-calculated, optimized sequences of images, each of which is progressively lower resolution representation, a lower represent, resolution representation of the previous. So here we have, um, on the left, something with no MIP mapping, and on the right, something with MIP mapping. And I guess we can, at least on my monitor, I can see these, um, like a rainbow of squiggly lines kind of going down my monitor. And that optical effect is not here. And then up here, we have the kind of crazy blurring. It just looks more like smooth blurring with MIP mapping, I guess. The height. And width of each image level, each image or level in the bitmap is a factor of two smaller than the previous level. Bitmaps do not have to be square. They are intended to increase rendering speed and reduce aliasing artifacts. Okay. So we have smaller versions of the images that, that I guess we can render probably when we need the smaller ones. 
All right. So calc gradients, we've got some MIP scale. And I guess that tells us which, perhaps which version of the map to render or something. Uh, MIP scale is one over float and then one shifted by MIP level. Cool. That's how much to scale it, I guess. If we're going to make a gradient, it should be, I guess, at the same scale as the MIP thing. And then we're probably just going to do some differentiation, right? Or, um, you know, difference calculations. And that seems to be what we're doing. X scale, inv, Y scale, inv, some axis stuff. And we're just doing some um, multiplication and subtraction. And then calling vector scale, I guess scale the vector. And then scaling by uh, some multiple of the MIP scale. And whatever sad just and tad just, S adjust, T adjust. S axis and T axis. I don't know what those two axes are. And then um, epsilon, so we never wander off the edge of this texture. Some corrections so we don't walk off the texture. And then draw surfaces. And draw surfaces is going to call out the draw solid surface and draw Z spans. Okay. So that's some of the drawing, some of the drawing stuff. I don't understand um, what's going on for a few reasons. One is I don't know much about um, how, how graphics are programmed. The other is um, this is uh, kind of working at a lower level and not everything is, is named or, or commented in a way that that makes it, that would make it clear to, to outsiders exactly what's going on. But we can, but I think, you know, we have a, a, are beginning to get a sense of what's going on. So a span is no definition, but a span should basically be, um, let's look at surf type. It should be the surface type. The surface type has next previous, so we have some sort of linked list structure. Fix me, compress, make a union if that will help. In submodel is only one, flags is fewer than 32, span state could be a byte. So that's just some optimization talk, I guess. Um, it has some E spans, a pointer to a linked list of spans to draw, and a key, a sorting key for BSP order. BSP order, that rings a bell. What is BSP order? Binary space partitioning? That sounds, okay, but I don't want this site. Binary space partitioning is a method for space partitioning in which, rec in which, recur which recursively subdivides a Euclidean space into two convex sets using hyperplanes as partitions. So this is gonna, um, we're gonna divide up the map basically so we can do binary search to talk about regions. And I think that's, and, and, and probably also things like occlusion. And so I think that's what's going on in BSP. The process of subdividing gives rise to a representation of objects within the space in the form of a tree data structure known as a BSP tree. Binary space partitioning was developed in the context of 3D graphic models in 1969. The structure stop this, of a V-tree is used for rendering because it can efficiently give spatial information about the object in a scene. All right. Okay. So we have a sorting key for BSP ordering. Um, we have last U. I still don't know what U is. It seems to be some sort of coordinate. It said during tracing, a span state for whether or not it's in a span or in the current span. I don't know what the um, scope of span is. It says zero is not in span. Negative one means it's in the inverted span. And before start, I guess going the other direction in a span. And then we have flags, um, data, which basically can be anything. It's a void star. It says associated data like M surface type. We have a float near ZI, which is the nearest one over Z on the surface for MIP mapping. In submodel, which is a Boolean, I guess, whether it's in some submodel. And then we have floats, which is DZ origin, DZ step 
U and DZ step V and some padding. Cool. One thing I want to know is um, what's the Z coordinate in um, game programming? I want, to, I want to know if there's a convention. I imagine the person were walking around, their X, Y position would be changing. And if they were to jump, then their Z position would be changing. My assumptions appear to be wrong because walking around a field seems to change X, Z. Each engine treats these coordinates differently. Generally speaking, X is almost always east, west, but whether Y or Z is the altitude axis tends to vary. As I understand it, Quake 3, the source engine, and the torque engine all have Z as up. It, make, it makes sense to have a coordinate system that is ordered roughly in descending order of importance. Okay. So that flattening a represent, representation into fewer dimensions is easier to understand. For example, if you're in 2D height, it makes sense for Z to be up, etc. Okay. So Z, um, assuming this is similar to the Quake engine that it mentioned, which I think was Quake 2, then I'm going to guess Z is up, which would allow us, as this said, to, to represent things. Um, you can kind of project down onto the 2D surface and then possibly store the, um, the Z data separately. So you can kind of, so if you have just the 2D surface, and I think Quake is a lot of things with walls and rooms. So you would basically have like a blueprint maybe of um, like the sort of like that an architect would give you. And that that's the X, Y information. It's on a, some sort of grid. And then, um, and that's a pretty, I guess, compact way to do things like um, occlusion and deciding where you are. And then maybe the Z data is, is somehow stored separately. At any rate, we have DZ, which seems like this is, that would be the, um, like the infinitesimal version of Z. I'm not sure that's what's going on, but just thinking aloud. Um, here's E spans. And I, I just want to know what the, I guess, span type is. E span S. It's under R shared. And we have UV and count. If this is changed, it must be changed in assembly draw dot H2. Okay, so the drawing operations, I guess, are in assembly. But what are U and V? Are these coordinates? U and V are often coordinates, I guess, for surfaces. Is that, is that what's going on? And we've got some E span S for P next. So we have, we have this, um, this list structure. Let's ask the internet, um, U and V in computer graphics. UV mapping. Oh, okay. It's a 3D modeling process of projecting a 3D model's surface to a 2D image for texture mapping. The letters U and V denote the axes of the 2D texture because X, Y, and Z are already used. Yeah, okay. So it is just taking the surface, having some um, patch or whatever of the surface and, and projecting down and U and V are the two coordinates. And let me see, um, maybe Quake rendering some 2D data. We have an article on the Quake engine. Looks promising. The 3D environment in which the game takes place is referred to as a map even though it is three-dimensional in nature rather than a flat 2D space. The map editor program uses a number of simple convex 3D geometric objects known as brushes that are sized and related to the build environment. The brushes are placed and oriented to create an enclosed, empty, volumetric space. And when the design is complete, the map is run through the rendering processor, preprocessor. The preprocessor is used to locate two types of empty space in the map, the empty space enclosed by brushes where the game will be played and the other empty space outside the brushes that the player will never see. I don't know why they're called brushes. 
The preprocessor is used to locate two types of empty space in the map. So whatever the brushes are, they're going to close something where the game will be. And then there's stuff that we're going to ignore because we'll never see it. Preprocessor then strips away the black, the back paces of the individual brushes, which are outside the game space, using leaving only a few polygons that define the outer perimeter of the enclosed game space. So here's an example. We have brushes used to define a play area. I guess, I guess it's brushes because these are like drawn. Then we see the interior of the play area and we ignore all the polygons outside that we, that we don't see. And then we ignore all the white space as well that were uncolored polygons. Okay. But it does seem like we're um, thinking in terms of flat objects, at least in this diagram. Generally, once a map has been pre-processed, it cannot be re-edited in a normal fashion because the original brushes have been cut up into small pieces. Okay. And it also has pre-calculating light and shadow and, and sectioning, speeding up the rendering. Okay, this is all interesting. Um, I'll add this to my, my list of things to, to read. Okay, um, here's our shared, which I think I opened up elsewhere as well, but let's take a quick look at it just from the top. A general refresh related stuff shared between the refresh and driver. So R is refresh. Thanks code comment. Um, and so this will be stuff that I guess needs to be drawn when you refresh. So we have the E spans, which we saw the surfaces, which we saw. We have 3D vectors, I guess, SX form axis, TX form axis. The S axis transformed into view space and the T axis transformed into view space. I still don't know what S and T are. We know what U and V are now and X and Y. Maybe this comment will tell me. Surfaces are generated in back to front order by the BSP. So if a surf pointer is greater than another one, it should be drawn in front. Surfaces of one is the background and is used for the active surface stack and surfaces of zero is a dummy because index zero is used to indicate no service, no service attached to edge T. Cool. There's some stuff about light style and clip masks, bottom clip and edge of edge S. I guess the edge type has U a U step, a previous and next, some surfaces, some surfs. And next remove in near ZI and owner. Okay, so I guess if we're an edge, we only have one coordinate. I don't know why it's necessarily the U coordinate, but maybe everything is parallel to the, to the U axis. Here's D draw uh, dot S. X86 assembly language horizontal 8 BP span drawing code. So this is some assembly code, I guess. So it seems like C. Maybe it's not. Is this, the, is this includes for assembly too? Maybe, maybe that's the style. Okay, so this is assembly code, which I'm not going to read because I don't understand it. And here's DNET C, which is rasterization driver initialization. So this is for rasterizing. And I don't know what sky direct is. Maybe whether you have direct vis visibility of the sky. Copy rectangles. This function is only required if the CPU doesn't have direct access to the back buffer. And there's some driver interface function that the driver doesn't support. We have uh, like setup frame, back buffer access. Okay, cool. Drawing. Poly SA assembly, uh, assembly language polygon drawing. So a lot of the graphic stuff, it seems to be in assembly. Here's the C file. Routines for drawing sets of polygons sharing the same texture. Okay, so these are, if things are, multiple things are maybe like made of wood or something. And we have some structs, a span package which has things like a P destination, uh, P Z, maybe like Z, whatever P is pointer, uh, count texture, probably then fraction S frac T frac, maybe what fraction in the S and T coordinates to, to color it and then light and then Z I. Is 
let's see what, what, what we're doing with ZI. Okay, yeah, so here's an example in scan, in D scan C, we're taking ZI and um, dividing OX 10,000 by it. And that's, and we're setting that to Z. So I think that's computing the Z, um, the Z coordinate from what is considering to be like a, um, possibly an, an infinitesimal or, or a scaled version of the, of the Z, kind of like the Z direction. Okay. So here's scan C. This should be stuff for scanning. C scan level rasterization code for all pixel depths. Warp screen. This performs a slight compression of the screen at the same time as the sign warp to leave the edges to keep the edges from wrapping. Huh. So we're gonna compress the screen so that the edges don't wrap. Okay. Draw turbulent. Band. I don't know how they're thinking of turbulence. Keep compiler happy. <laughs> um, I'm curious what turbulent is, but I don't think I have the... Uh, I, I've, I've seen enough of this code to know that I don't think that I'm just going to be able to figure it out by, by looking at the code. But I'm guessing it's some sort of turbulence stuff. Draw span 8. Draw Z spans. Maybe we can find out who calls draw turbulent. And that might tell us something about what it's supposed to be doing. Let's look at turbulent eight, I guess. Edge, scan, D edge local. I'm not sure. I guess it doesn't really seem like turb that it's actually doing anything for like flows or like turbulent flows. Not sure what that's supposed to be doing. Here's another assembly file, which we're going to skip. Dvars. This could be interesting or could not be interesting. We have mainly things like S div and X, T and Z. S, T and Z. Maybe uh, S and T or maybe we don't have X coordinates and Y coordinates at all. We just have S and T. S and, T. and then Z is the up. I'm not sure. Quake ST coordinates. Let's see if the internet knows. Use a standard left handed XYZ coordinate system. Searching for T is not so useful. I don't know, but this actually seems interesting. The Quake spec. Uh, we'll move on. What is this? Rasterization. Um, let's ignore rasterization and see what else we can find. Sprites. We can draw sprite spans. Um, And this is more kind of similar, um, similar math. And we're doing S over Z, T over Z, ZI fixed, S and T is the last pixels, pixel span, can't step off polygon, clamp, recalculate. Okay, this looks like a possibly interesting algorithm. What is this doing again? Sprite draw spans. Okay. So first we calculate the initial S over Z, T over Z, 1 over Z, S and T, and clamp. So we're inverse scaling by Z. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, and then we, and then I think we regain Z later. If you count on FP, is a pre-scale. Calculate S and T at the far edge of the span, far end of the span. 
and then calculating more s over z t over z um z i fixed and then calculate the s and t steps across the span by shifting and more and more and then we've got this next span thing which i guess are we calling go to Let's try that again. Next span. Yeah, go to next span. Okay, so we've got some go tos. Um, the sprite draw spans. Interesting. Okay, so we're, we've got this kind of like do while loop, and we've got go tos in it. And I guess once we once we figured out that we're that we're done, I guess with count less than or equal to zero, we're done with this thing. And I guess we're done drawing all the sub span type things. And then we're going to uh, go to the next span to draw it. And then draw right edge, draw left edge, calculate gradients for sprites. The uh, draw sprite itself. Find top and bottom ver vertices. Make sure there's at least one scan to draw. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then. Down here, we call it to a bunch of functions, including calculate gradients, scan left edge, scan right edge, and then sprite draw spans on at the end. All right, so like I, I'm getting a feel for how the graphics works. To really understand what's going on with the, the graphics, we would need a few things. One is we would ultimately probably need to understand the assembly. And the other is we'd have to basically reverse engineer what's going on um, in, I guess, Carmack's head as he's writing these algorithms. And I don't know, um, I don't think I'm, I'm going to be able to do that live without running the code. And, um, and I'm not sure even if I did how much that, how much light that would shed on this. So I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to dig in deeper, but we might, um, at the end, ask, uh, ask a chat GBT what it thinks about some of these algorithms. Here's sky C. This is probably something about the sky. <laughs> sky speed. There's more drawing routines. And it's kind of like all the same flavor. You can kind of tell that, that this is all programmed by the same person. Um, I don't know if Quake... I, was, is Quake all indoors? When did Quake come out? 1996? I guess you can sometimes see the sky. All right, you're not going to let me look at this image? So I guess that, I guess, I guess um, this is like when you're looking up, do you see sky? Is, is, is I'm guessing what's going on with those, with that code and, and drawing the sky, if so. Z point, we can draw a point. Z point desk color. I, I think that that's going to be less interesting than um, other things. Here's draw to H. You can init, you can draw init, draw a character, draw a pick, a trans pick, a console background. Um. Draw a string, pick from mod, etc. Okay. Draw dot C. Cash pick. All right, I'm going to. I'm going to go past the drawing. I wanted to see, um, or maybe QL Quake. I want to see some of the big, um, see if there's anything super interesting in the entry points. I want to take a look at the, the math libraries. Uh, let's see. So we have this GL rendering stuff. Okay, so this is GL Quake. So I guess this is Quake with GL support, like open GL support. Um, and... 
I'm I'm guessing this is mostly stuff we can ignore. Yeah, as you Quake 2 is I'm guessing possibly for Quake 2. Host.c. I'm just curious what's here. A server can always be started. Even if the system started out as a client to a remote system, a client cannot be started if the server started as a dedicated server. Memory is cleared, released when the server or client begins, not when they end. Okay. So we have like um, some parameters, whether it's initialized, frame time, host time, real time, host client, host speeds, and frame rate, tick rate, which I guess by default is, zero, is 0 0.05. Frag limit, I'm not sure what that is, time limit, team play. And then if we're in Quake 2, then we've got some other stuff. And then skills, whether I guess skill level, death match, whether it's cooperative, whether you can pause it. And then we can, if you're a host, I guess you can end the game and it will do what? It will call VA start, whatever that is. It'll print out some stuff and call VA end. And then print some more stuff to the console, host end game. And then if stuff is, is active, we're going to shut down the server, etc. cetera. We have host error. Okay. Cool. Host commands. What sorts of commands are there? Menu quit, host status. I guess this is like there's some host um, things you can configure as a host. No uh, host, no, no target. And there's, I guess, some option. No target on, no target off are being printed to the console. No clip, I guess, is some other option. Host fly, can the host fly? That's client to fly mode. Hmm. Server transitions. Okay. Uh, here's math and it's a dot s file is that assembly okay so let's open math dot s in emacs and uh, see if we have a math dot c behind it we have math lib dot c we can project a point onto a plane which should basically just be projective geometry stuff. We can get a perpendicular vector given a destination and a source, probably by just taking the cross product, essentially. Assume source is normalized. Okay. Find the smallest magnitude axially aligned vector. For what? For source? And then... And project the point onto the plane defined by source. So source is uh, so good. Dest, temp, vec, and source. Is project on plane taking two vectors to define the plane? So destination p and normal. Okay. So the normal is going to define the plane. What is p? Oh, p is the point. Okay, so we're going to project the temp vec onto the plane normal to source. And then we're going to normalize the destination vector, perpendicular vector. Okay. And then rotate a point around a vector. So this is just some rotation. Normally, I guess you would do this with matrices. But this is essentially the, it seems like it's like the matrix calculation unrolled. We have Z-rot, memset Z-rot, size of Z-rot. Is Z-rot passed in? No, you have a point, a direction, a dest, uh, DST, and degrees, rotational degrees. Okay. And then where's Zrot created? Um, I guess this creates it. No. Oh, Zrot is here. It's a, it's a three by three matrix, as you might expect. All right. Uh, so this is like geometry. A Bob's error. Split out like this for assembly to call. Box on plane side, I'm not sure. Turns one, two, or one plus two. So you're gonna give it an emins, an emax, and a plane. And I guess you're gonna return whether, which side of the plane you're on. And this, I guess, is more just geometry. 
then angle vectors. You're going to give it angles forward, a right, and up. And I'm not sure really what, what it's going to do. We have a vector compare functor, uh, function. Vector MA, I'm not sure what MA is supposed to be. We're basically scaling, right? So we give it a vector A, a scale, and a vector B. Um, so this is uh, just adding A to this to the ski, B scaled vector. And we have a dot product, vector subtract, vector add. These are all like um, linear algebra libraries. We have a square root function, which is, I guess, maybe implemented in assembly. We have a length function. We can normalize vectors, get a vector inverse, which is the negative of the vector. We can scale a vector. We have Q log two. I don't know what Q is, but we're going to set answer to zero and then divide and shift over bits one at a time, incrementing the answer until we get the answer back. That's just computing the, the, the log two, but um, I guess not quite because I think we lose information by doing the, the uh, by doing things this way. And maybe that's what Q means. R, uh, we can concatenate some rotations. I guess there's like matrix, um, matrix composition, um, linear, linear map composition, I guess, matrix product seems to be in cadenet transforms floor div mod returns mathematically correct floor based quotient and remainder for number and demon both of which should contain no fractional part the quotient must fit in 32 bits um floor div mod Math mathematically correct floor based quotient and remainder as opposed to like a faster version that, that, that doesn't quite give you everything. So we're just going to get the remainder, right? Quotient and remainder division algorithm. Okay. And we have a GCD algorithm. Invert 24 to 16. Inverts an 8.24 value to a 16.16 .16 value. I don't know. I don't know where 8. Wait, 8.24 or 16.16 or .16 are. But, okay. And somebody was talking about the square root algorithm. That might be an, an assembly. We have square root. Is this just the C square root function? We're including math.h. I think it's just the C one, right? We'll see if we can find um, the square root function before we go. Here's mathlib.h, which is just a header. And box on plain size has a on plain side has a comment, which I guess we don't really need. Here's model.h. This is brush model. So this is the brush stuff I think that we saw in in like the Wikipedia article. And these are important because they have assembly routines associated with them. Everything with the three um, exclamation marks on either side is assembly related. Um, we have a VEC32 VEC3 position, which is important. We have an M plane, which has a normal, seems just like a plane, a normal, maybe a distance, a type, sign bits, and pad. Well, uh, sign bits might be for like orientation. But that could also be encoded in normal, right? Sign x plus sign y is shifted over by one, and plus sign z shifted over by one. Okay, and then a texture, which has a name, a width and a height, anim total, the total tenth of a sequence in sequence. I guess for animation, and animation min and, and max. Next, alternate animations in offsets. And then surface types, I guess. Plane back, draw sky, draw sprite, draw turb, draw tile, draw background. Hmm. And then we have things like sprite model. They have a width, a height. A sprite frame has a width, a height, 
a cache spot, maybe where it's cached, up, down, left, and right, which are floats, and pixels. And a sprite group has a number of frames, intervals, and sprite frames. And then we have some more stuff. And, and then a sprite has a type of max width, max height, number of frames, a beam length, and a cache spot, which we may want to remove. And then the sprite frame description. All right. The alias models are position independent so the cache manager can move them. Okay, so we can have, we have like position independent, I guess, models that can be moved around. And then we have a whole model. I don't know what a whole model is, but it's, I guess, mod type. You're going to define things like rockets, grenades, gib, rotate, tracer, zom gib, tracer one, tracer two, and tracer three. Tracer two is orange split trail and rotate. And then tracer three is purple trail. And a model has something like it has like name, whether it needs to be load, a type, number of frames, sync type and flags. Also mins and maxes. This is the volume. Then the brush stuff. We saw brush in the Wikipedia model. And we have things like first model surface, number of model surfaces, number of submodels, number of planes, number of leaves, number of vertices and edges and nodes. Texture info, stuff about surfaces, like number of surfaces and, and, and the list of surfaces. We have surface edges, uh, mark surfaces, I guess surfaces that, that has some sort of mark information, clip nodes, and textures. Okay, so this seems like a pretty key file. And that's where all the model stuff is. Model C is going to be the implementation. It has things like point and leaf give it a point in a model. Uh, decompress viz. We've got this decompressed function. I guess we're going to compress some of our models for memory. Um, we're keeping memory tight and then we decompress them as needed. We can load models and that sort of stuff. That's cool. Net sir. This is probably networking stuff. Serial line. Like, I guess computing. Mm, Communicating over a serial line. We're going to ignore that. Qbat will ignore. QuakeAssembly.h, I guess we'll ignore. But we've noted, I, I, we've seen a lot of these extern Cs stuff, like um, turb stuff and PZ buffer and, and whatnot and colors. So this is some entry point for the assembly. So these are the, these are the things that I guess the assembly is aware of. Quake def. I'm not sure. This looks interesting. We have a cache size. That's not so interesting. We have things like up, down, pitch, yaw, and roll. Uh, some stuff with OS paths. Save game comment length. Max CL stats is 32. Stats are integers communicated to the client by the server. We have stats include for things like health, frags, Weapon, ammo, armor, spells, active weapon. And we have a bunch of weapons like shotgun, nail gun, shells, armor. Rogue changed and added defines. Rogue, I don't know. RIT shells, RIT armor. Hypnotic. I guess these are maybe expansion packs. We have some quick parameters, which are things like base directory, cache directory, argc, argv, mem base, and mem size. Mm -hmm. And some host host info. Okay. RA clip, this should be rasterization for, for alias clipping. Clip routines for drawing alias models. We're going to ignore that. And really, we're going to ignore all the rasterization stuff. Render, we want render. We have this efrag type in render. We have an entity type. I think we've also seen another um, 
description of entity. But then entity has entity has force link, um, update, baseline, message time, skin num for alias models, and, I'm not, and some other stuff. I can't decide whether this is going to be important or not. It's actually small, so this I guess is not so important. SV main. I think we've looked at SV stuff, server stuff. Yeah. Wad. I'm just not sure what what wad is. Wad dot h. Types. So what is wad? Non uh, LZSS lumpy palette Q text MIP text. Is LZSS compression? Wad info lump info. I don't know. Something about compression maybe in pictures. Wad two or two. Uh, let's see. Or, or some sort of file type, I guess. Maybe this is for um, writing stuff to, to files. So winquake.h, this should be the main header. And we see a lot of kind of just general stuff. Show mouse, hide mouse, deactivate mouse. Stuff about sound, Pascal. Um, like set socket options, send to socket name. Okay, it's just kind of like an entry point. Winquick RC. I don't know what this is, but it doesn't look so important. Here's world.h, which might be important. A plane has a normal and a dist. The normal is a, is a vector. I guess dist is, is how much a, uh, out of the vector to draw. Probably, I don't know. So we have a trace type, which has, whether it's solid, whether it's start solid, whether it's open or in water, the fraction, time completed, 1.0 means didn't hit anything. Okay, so this is the trace stuff we saw before. So, um, so 1.0 means doesn't hit anything, which we conjectured. End position is the final position. The plane, the surface normal to, at impact. Okay, so we're gonna hit something um, and it's going to, I guess, hit at some angle. And is that the, the plane, um, the normal to the surface that, it, that it's hitting and, and the, the entity the surface is on. And you can do things like un, unlink edict call before removing an entity and before trying to move one. So it doesn't clip against itself. The comments are under the function which is an interesting style I don't think I've seen before. Um, link edict needs to be called anytime an entity changes origin, mins, maxes, or solid. Flags, ent.v modified sets ent.v absin and ent.v apps max. If touch triggers, calls prog functions for the intersected triggers. Okay, then we can move. Mins and maxes are relative. If the entire move stays on a solid volume, Trace all solid will be set. Here's world C. This should just be the implementation, right? We have hull boxes. So things are, I guess, boxes around the convex hull, maybe. Init box hull. Set up the planes and clip nodes so that the six floats of a bounding box can just be stored out and get a proper hull structure. All right, so we can get a hull for an entity. Returns a hull that can be used for testing or clipping an object for min's max. So this is um, this is this should all just be like kind of like standard geometry stuff, um, which maybe this is a good file to read as an entry point if you're interested in um, in computer graphics and want to see how how Quake does some of the stuff. Uh, my sense is. Um, this this stuff should mostly be straightforward. We haven't really gone too deep into how any of the geometry works in in, in video games. Um, but since we're about two hours in, and I don't I don't think this is necessarily where the most interesting Quake stuff is going to be. I think I'm going to I think I'm going to move on.
Um, but this does look like a cool file for um, for explo exploring things like how clipping works, maybe like how intersection works and, and that sort of stuff. Zone, I'm not sure what's up with zone. Oh, memory allocation. Okay, so this is like zone memory allocation. And we get uh, some information about it. High hunk allocations are at the top. High hunk reset point held by vid. Then the video buffer, then the Z buffer. And the surface cache, etc. Now that I think about it, let's let me look up Z buffer. Z buffering. A depth buffer, also known as Z buffer, is a type of data buffer used in computer graphics to represent depth information of objects in 3D space. Okay. From a particular perspective, so it has some. Um, it has like a, you are somewhere in the image. And so as you change around, I guess the Z buffer changes. They're used to, to aid rendering. So like uh, the correct polygons properly include other polygons. Oh, this is okay. Z calling. I think this is Here's an example. I think this is telling us which things are including other, other things. And three dimensional scene and the Z buffer representation the objects are like black. We have no shadows. And the near objects seem darker. Is that right? In a 3D rendering pipeline, when an object is projected on the screen, the depth or Z value of a generated fragment in the projected screen image is compared to the value already stored in the buffer. A depth test and replaces it with a new value if the new value is closer. Okay. I see. So we're keeping track of the depth from the camera, essentially. And um, like as as we're checking things, we'll, we'll check if something is closer and replace it kind of like a standard max algorithm. I think that's basically what's going on. After perspective transformation, the new value of Z or Z prime is defined by Z prime is far plus near over far minus near plus one over Z negative two times far times near over far minus near. This might be why we have the, um, the one over Z in the code. They, I guess that's probably part of projective transformations. The zone is, is memory zones. We'll ignore this common. I think we've seen, we've come across. And let's see what else is here. And we have a size buff. Allow overflow or not allow or overflow. I've never seen someone explicitly allowing overflow on a buffer. So um, we have alloc free allocation stuff, link list stuff like clear link, remove link. Uh, whether we're big ending or not. And big, long, little, long. You have the message stuff, which is going to take an SB, a size buff. So I guess write message is essentially populating a buffer with an int. And the int, oh, sorry, sorry write code uses, write car uses an int. And then similarly, you just have these other um, writing different types, I guess, to the buffer. And then we could read buffers. And I guess we're just taking some buffer and sending it over the network. And that's how we do. We just we take, It seems like we're just taking a memory representation and sending it, possibly adjusting for big endiness, and then just um, reading the, the, the memory contents again on, on the other side. Here's the implementation file. And I guess there's nothing especially so interesting here. You get some string routines. Chase. Chase camera code. I guess this is the camera following you. Chase reset, trace line, angle vectors. Okay. Something about cameras and chasing. Quake def. I oh, know here's CL main.c. I don't know what CL is. Client main loop. Okay. See if we can find the main loop. Uh, disconnect. Clear state. 
establish connection, set pal, that's some debugging stuff. Alert point term determines the fraction between the last two messages that the object should be put at. The lerp should be, what was it, linear interpolation? Something, something. Look it up again. Linear interpolation. So we might have to linearly interpolate, interpolate between some stuff, between the last two messages that the object should be put at. I guess we're interpolating maybe because to, to account for network latency. But I don't know why we're using the last two messages, the fraction between the last two messages. So what are we doing? We have something like times demo. Um, if S is bigger than 0 .0, 0 0.1, it says dropped packet or start of demo. I don't know. I guess somehow we're inferring that we might have dropped a, a, a packet, probably a UDP packet. Um, and then the fr frac is initially set to be cl.time minus, uh, so I guess client time minus client message time divided by f. Yeah, so I think we're trying to figure out where we would be, where we should be, given our, maybe given our direction and, and where we most, most recently were told to be from the server. And then trying to interpolate based on that, I, I think is the sort of thing that's doing. You have this relink and entities, which we saw had to be called essentially when things were dirty, I, th I think. You've got um, the entity type, a delta, which is a vector, fractions, um, F, frac F and D, maybe stop that. Uh, I and J seems like probably just indices. Bob J rotate, <laughs> rotate something, I don't know, maybe head bobbing, um, the old origin and DL, which is some light thing. And then we'll determine the partial update time by calling lerp, lerp point, getting, getting that fraction, interpolate player info. And we're going to set the, I guess, client velocity to be client M velocity. So M velocity says the client maintains its own idea of view angles which are sent to the server each frame. The server sets punch angle when the view is temporarily offset and an angle reset commands at the start, an angle reset commands at the start of each level and after teleporting. But M velocity, it says update by server used for lean and Bob. So M velocity is something about leaning and bobbing and it's from the server. Um, but anyway, we're going to set it to M velocity plus some, the fraction of the distance between M velocity zero one and M velocity one, uh, sorry, M velocity at zero and M velocity one. So maybe first most recent message in, in the previous one, we'll check if we're in the demo and then Bob J rotate will be some angle mod times a hundred times client time. Okay. So maybe periodically we're going to do this because we're doing angle mod presumably is modulus in the uh, angle coordinates and we're basing it on time. So this seems like periodically, um, we're going to Bob every so often. And it says start on the entity after the world and we're going to iterate over entities, some entities. And if not entity model, there's an empty slot. We're going to force link. Oh, we're going to check if it's force link, in which case we're going to remove frags. Maybe frags are like the uh, dead players. Continue. And then if the object wasn't included in the last packet, remove it. So we'll, we'll check um, message time and compare it to the most recent message time. And if it's not there, then I guess we, I guess whenever we get an M message or whatever, we update all of the entities. And so if this, if these times aren't equal, then we uh, eliminate the model. I guess it's disappeared. Then we're going to copy the, or the old origin to the new origin. 
tag if we need a force link, which could, in case we'll do some vector copying. This entity was not updated, updated in the last message to move to the final spot if the force link. Otherwise, if the delta is large, assume a teleport and don't lerp. Okay, so if we if we um, get a huge delta, then we're not explicitly saying whether things were teleported, but we're just going to essentially like I guess blink the character out of existence and then blink it back to existence at the endpoint. Otherwise, we're going to interpolate the origin and angles. And maybe by interpolation it means draw the draw the frames from here to there rather than trying to find the intermediate vector, which is how I was originally thinking of it. But since they're contrasting it with teleporting, I'm guessing that interpolation means um, that, they're, that they're kind of drawing a continuous path. And then we're going to rotate binary objects locally. So Bob J. Oh, okay. So maybe Bob J. Rotate is about. I don't know. We're doing some rotating. We've got bright fields, dark fields, muzzle flash. Doing all sorts of like other animation stuff, dim lights. I still don't know what Gib is. It seems like be some sort of enemy, Gib and Zom Gib. And then kind of doing the rest of the animations from the server, I suppose. Then we can read from a server. That's all actually kind of cool. Um, I didn't follow it in its entirety, and I kind of am just ignoring the, the stuff at the end. But. Um, in broad strokes, it's, it's, I think it's relatively clear what what they're doing. Right, what do we, so a norms should just be normals, and this is just a kind of a big table. And then a norm dots is probably not so interesting. So I think that's the end of the um, files I have opened, but I want to um, look up the square root alg algorithm. Fast inverse square root. It seems like you just do the Taylor expansion is the obvious thing. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see what it says. That approximates. Oh, inverse as in. Um, oh, yeah. The inverse of square root would be a square. <laughs> but I guess it's it's approximating one over square root of x. Um, of the, okay. But where is uh, Quake? The algorithm was often misattributed to John Carmack, but in fact, the code is based on an unpublished paper by William Kahan, a mathematician. And Casey Eng circulated in May 1986. The original constant was produced by a collaboration between Cleve Moeller and Gregory Walsh while they worked for Arden Computing in the late, in the late 1980s. So I guess it's probably used in Quake, probably popularized in Quake. Um, let's see what else we see about Quake. Uh, it's best known for its implementation in the 1999 game Quake 3 Arena, which we, as far as I know, we don't have the source code code, so source code too, although we may have seen some Arena stuff. I was kind of ignoring um, message pack update stuff. Um, so we might have this. Uh, let's see. The inverse square root of a floating point number is used in calculating a normalized vector. Okay, so we're gonna just use it for vector normalization. Programs can be norm uh, can use normalized vectors to determine angles of incidence and reflection. Yeah, millions of calculations every second to simulate lighting. When the code was developed in the early 1990s, most floating point processing power lagged the speed of integer processing. This was troublesome for 3D graphics programs before the advent of specialized ha ha hardware to handle transform and lighting. Overview, here's the code. Q R square root, why is it Q? Oh, the following code, code is the fast inverse square root implementation for Quake 3 Arena, stripped of C preprocessor directives, but including the exact original comment text. Exact, <laughs> okay. So I guess Quake R square root maybe? We take a float number. Um, we'll create i and x2 and y in the constant float three halves, which is 1.5. We're setting x2 to half of f or, or 
or we're multiplying yeah to, to, to half of number we're setting y to number and i is going to be star of long star of and y evil floating point bit level hacking okay um and here's a constant minus i shifted over by one with the comment what the fuck I guess what the fuck, because this constant comes from nowhere. And uh, we saw that it appeared in the, the mathematical research. Um, and so maybe we can learn about it a, a little bit. And then we're going to do this other evil uh, floating point bit level hacking. And then y is going to be set to y times 3 halves minus x2 times the square of y, which is the first iteration. And the second iteration can be removed. In fact, we don't even do the second iteration. And we've commented it out. I'm going to return y. At the, general, at the time, the general method to compute the inverse square root was to calculate an approximation for 1 over square root of x, then revise that approximation via another method until it came within an acceptable error range of the actual result. OK. The, I guess they use lookup tables. The key? of the fast inverse square root function was directly compute an approximation by utilizing the structure of floating point numbers proving faster than lookup tables. Okay, so floating point numbers have some explicit definition as like we've decided how to how to do them in a, in a specific way. And it sounds like we're like utilizing implementation implementation details of that definition to get squeeze out extra performance or something. Approximately four times faster than computing the square root with another method and calculating the reciprocal via floating point division. Here's a work example, and I'm not going <laughs> to read it because I'm going to mess up all these numbers. Bit pattern of both x and y is the first thing shift right one position to the second, and then we have the magic number here, and the result of magic number minus um, shifting right to one position. And then we can avoid undefined behavior. Where's the constant? The advantages in speed offered by the fast inverse square root trick came from treating the 32-bit floating point word as an integer. Yeah, subtracting it from a magic constant, which is this thing. This integer subtraction and bit shift results in a bit pattern, which when redefined as a floating point number is rough is a rough approximation of the square root of the number. Oh, okay, I see. So um so we have a floating point word. Uh, so, so we have some floating point number, which is some combination of essentially a base and the thing that we're taking is essentially in like scientific notation, right? Um, but it's some just it's just some group of bits. And so you can ignore the floating point structure, which is like the forgetful functor from floating point into list of bits, and then interpret that list of bits as an integer. And then we're going to subtract it by this magic constant. I don't know what this magic constant means in, uh, if it has any meaning in floating point, but we are now doing, I guess, integer subtraction. Uh, in addition to, to sub, in addition to considering, right, in, in addition to considering this thing now an integer, um, we're using the integer subtraction algorithm and subtracting it, subtracting it from this magic constant. And then you do a bit shift. And then somehow these people figured out that this is an approximation to the square root. And let's see if we can find the paper. Using bit filling techniques followed by Newton durations. Hmm. Is this the publication? No, this is just an implementation. I mean, this is interesting. Maybe if folks are interested um, in this function, they can they can check out um, some of the references here. But just for the sake of curiosity, let's figure out if this function is actually in the code that we have. Q square root. Maybe a closed source graph. Let's try. Oh, I keep forgetting that. Whatever window manager this is, the icons don't have my 
already open stuff. They just open a new, they just launch a new thing. Okay. So I want to do crap, right? I think it was Q square root. Did I spell it right? Q R square root. Like that. I don't see it. Let's try searching for, I guess, this magic constant. Yeah. So I think that whatever the, the, so I don't think we have Quake 3 is the thing. So there, Quake 3 might be available somewhere. But this apparently appeared for like the most well known version appeared first in Quake 3. We have Quake 3 Arena. And we do have the Q the QR square root function here. So if you're interested in the in seeing this again, it seems to be exactly on Wikipedia, but um that it that does seem to be available in the in the Quake 3 arena source code. So that's Quake. Uh what did we learn? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um the uh you can tell that there's a lot of thought put into things like optimization that they were rolling a lot of their own stuff. And I think that's one of the things that, um, that, that John Carmack is known for is being, being very clever about how to, to squeeze out performance and graphics and stuff. And since he, at, at least since he knows about, um, uh, at least since he knows about things like this, this square root paper, he seems to be somehow tuned into um, the underworld of, like graphics, <laughs> performance preprints and stuff like that. And I think that probably, um, that probably helped him out a bit. Oh, and I'm, I'm realizing, um, Nishant that, uh, that, that, that I missed a, a chat. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't know if you're still around, um, but he, but Nishant says he can't stay around long, but I wanted to swing by and say that a lot of people I mentor are enjoying your code. Oh, great. That's cool. I, I would love to hear more about that. I'm not sure about YouTube engagement, but a lot of people I know appreciate it. That's great. Um, that's really cool to hear. If you're still around, um, um, maybe a, a, uh, I guess I'm just curious what, what, um, like what kind, uh, how you're involved in like mentoring or whatever. Um, but that's cool. Sorry. I missed that. I was not, <laughs> sometimes I just forget to, to check the chat if, if people haven't said things for a while. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so Quake is cool. I think that, um, um, I was hoping that like, as I was looking through things, I would be able to, to really follow the, to really follow the code and have a sense for like what was clever or unique about it. But I think to really understand that it's first of all, going to take more than, more than one pass, like many things, but also, um, you basically have to like conjure up whatever frame of mind like Carmack and the other authors of this code were in, because there's a lot of context that's not explicitly there that you'd, you'd basically have to, um, I think chat GPT is actually pretty good at this sort of thing, like figuring out, uh, you know, why are you, why are you adding this pointer? Where does the number four come from? Why four, 16, and then 24, 24 is not a power of two. Um, so all of those sorts of things, you, uh, you either need to know uh, graphics of that era and just have an appreciation for um, for how those things work, and then you and then maybe you see something like th this code, and you're like, oh wow, this is like super cool. I hadn't thought of this trick, or you need to have some kind of other context that I think that that I just don't have um, given my background um, to to really understand what what makes some of that graphic stuff super cool on on a first read through. Um, and I wouldn't really even know what. Um, like where the cool stuff is, because you you could like spend a long time trying to figure out one algorithm to realize it's really just 
um, a standard algorithm kind of like written out in a, in a different way than you expected or using the, you know, using types from Quake as opposed to using other kinds of types. So, um, but given that, um, you, there, there is a lot you can, there is a lot you can tell. We have looked at, um, some, um, video game code before, including like in MAME, we saw stuff that was, that was really close to the hardware. And then we've looked at things like Blender, um, and the Godot game engine. And those are, and I think super tux cart. And those are things that are, um, using more like linear algebra, um, libraries and, or, or quaternion libraries. And then Quake is kind of in between those two. So we, he, there, there's assembly there. So it's close to the hardware in, in that sense. And then, um, there's no, there's no like importing of a fast linear algebra library, kind of all of the routines are, are done by hand. Um, so that's really interesting. And then I think, I think the thing that was maybe most interesting to me, um, as we, you know, as I was going through it was seeing how, um, the seeing how the, the look and feel of the game, I guess, like shows up in the code, like things like, what are the monsters? How do they, how are we making them move? Like what's, how, how intelligent are they really? Um, and like, how do weapons work? And we, you know, we didn't necessarily tie all of that kind of together, but, you know, as, as I was going along, I, that was, I was sort of connecting those things, those things in my mind. And I think that, um, you know, if you look at the code too, <laughs> then, uh, then, then you'll also begin to get a sense of that, that sort of stuff. And, you know, we're definitely in a place where if we had Quake assets and you might have Quake assets, if you have a copy of the game or whatever, then, um, you could not only make mods, which you should be able to do with that, the, the Quake script stuff, but you could also do things like change the core code, um, and make different versions. Um, you could probably plug in an AI algorithm if you wanted to, um, or, or make the, the monsters more intelligent and, and stuff like that. So that's all for Quake. Um, I probably should have said this at the beginning of the video, but next week I'm doing, um, less of the code reading streamings. I'm going to do one on Wednesday, which is to be determined. And I'm doing one on, um, on Friday, which will be fan request. And then going forward, instead of alternating between fun Friday and fan request Friday, I think I'm just going to do all fan requests. That way, um, we won't be so rate limited in, in making sure that people get their requests in. And next week, the reason I'm taking off some time from doing these code reading things is I want to open up time for beginning to transition more toward writing code and doing live coding. And, um, I want to make sure I have time to set things up and, you know, set up a, de a developer environment and all that sort of stuff. And, um, if I get that all set up in time, I might do, um, some live coding next week, not um, not as part of the schedule, let's read source code series, but I might just pop in here or there and then, and, and then if people are around, they can join or whatnot. Um, but, uh, as I go through that process, that's when I'll decide, you know, what I want to do for, uh, sorry, I think I said Wednesday, but, but really it's on Thursday, um, for the TBD one. So that might be something that, uh, you know, some problem that I'm running into that inspires that, or it might just be something like I've really decided I, I need to read <laughs> some particular code base or whatever, just out of curiosity. So that'll be TBD. And then, um, either way, I'm going to be recording a lot of my process of setting things up and getting an environment ready. Um, and then some of that will, will begin to come out, uh, as, um, as edited videos. I spent a little bit of time learning, <laughs> learning Caden live. And, uh, for a while it was a little bit of a battle, but I think I'm getting, getting a feel for it. Um, and so, uh, and so I'm going to start adding things like, um, th things like edited videos and in particular with some of the live coding stuff, um, I, I don't know how much live, <laughs> live streaming I can do, um, I might need to do some of the coding kind of at the computer, but also like taking breaks, like pacing around, um, taking time to think. And I'm, I, I don't think that that will all make very good 
um, live streaming content. So I may do kind of cuts of like, you know, of, of the coding in addition to doing at some point also just some live coding so that I can interact more with folks. So that's kind of what's, uh, what's ahead. Um, and after next week, the, I, I should either, you know, I might do two weeks of, uh, of kind of this transition period, but I'm, I'm, you know, the, the idea is that in the near future, maybe the week after next or the week after the week after next, um, I'll be putting back up more of a, uh, an explicit schedule so that folks know what to expect and, and things are kind of tailored to, to, uh, where we're going next. So that's all for me. Um, I hope you enjoyed <laughs> reading the Quake code and have a good weekend. Thanks for watching.